Breaking news. Nikon has confirmed the Z6 and Z7 Mark II full-frame mirrorless cameras are coming. I think I know the specs and I'm taking a pretty good guess about the price. Not right 100% of the time, but it's like your weatherman, you know? Like, if you don't watch them, then you're guaranteed it's gonna rain on your picnic. First, I wanna thank our sponsor, Squarespace. If you need a website, Squarespace makes it incredibly easy. You pick one of many beautiful templates, you drag your pictures in, you write a little bit about yourself, and it's up, and it works absolutely beautifully. You need at least one photography portfolio, but you might also need websites for different businesses that you have. Squarespace is how I do it, it's how everybody should do it. If you want your own Squarespace website, head to squarespace.com slash Tony and just try it out. No obligation, no credit card, use it for 14 days, if you love it, the coupon code TONY will give you 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. And thanks to NikonRumors.com for providing the source of a lot of these specs, though I'm going to be supplementing with my own thoughts too. First up, this is going to be disappointing to some of you, but the Z6 and Z7 Mark II still have the same sensors as the previous camera. The Z6 is the lower end camera with 24 megapixels and the Z7 is the 45 megapixel, no AA filter, high resolution camera for people who are doing like landscapes and commercial photography or anybody who doesn't mind dealing with really big files. These are the successors to the cameras that launched a couple of years ago with the Z mount. And honestly, the first generation, well, we found them really disappointing, especially with the first firmware. The problem wasn't that they were bad cameras, the problem was they didn't meet our expectations that Nikon had built up with their own amazing SLRs, like that D850 over there, which remains my favorite camera of all time to use. And the Z6 and Z7, well, they don't solve all of the problems with the previous generation cameras. For example, they have the same bodies. And I know, a lot of people love the way they feel, but to me, I was spoiled by the Nikon DSLRs, the lighted buttons of the D850, that nice row of buttons along the left side. They, they feel better than any other camera I've ever used. And while the Z cameras, they feel good in the hands, they never quite had that magic. They also still rumored to have just a tilt screen that flips up and down like that, as opposed to a flippy screen that flips out from the side. Now, your reactions are gonna vary. Some of you are saying, oh good, I'm just a stills photographer, I hate the flip screen. But the fact of the matter is that more creators are buying cameras now than stills photographers. We've looked at the trends and people need sort of hybrid video cameras more than they need a stills only camera. So many people right now are creating video content at home, whether they're teaching classes or just trying to communicate with their family. And the flip screen helps creators like myself do that. And the way camera manufacturers sort of justify the R&D of these cameras is by allowing a wider assortment of audiences to buy them. So by giving it just a tilt screen and really excluding all of those creators, it makes me wonder if they're going to hit that critical mass that they need to save Nikon from unprofitability, something that we've been really concerned about with the future of the company. NikonRumors.com is also saying that they'll have the same EVF, which we found to be good enough. We're happy with that. But using the newer EVFs in cameras like the Canon R5 or the greatest EVF ever, the Sony a7S Mark III, where you feel like you're looking through a window into something that's actually better than reality. It's just big and huge and like nine million dots. Well, it makes me wish that it could be a little bit better as long as we were doing an upgrade, but it's only a nice to have. They also still have sensor stabilization, something that we've come to simply demand out of every camera that we own. The biggest thing is really the most boring, and that's that the new cameras will have dual X-speed processors. So they'll have a bit more processing power, and that's so boring to say, but the end effect is going to be an overall much more useful camera. With those extra processors, it'll be able to do better face, eye, and animal AF. And that was really the number one problem that we had with the Z6 and Z7 original cameras. However, the portrait lens produces such shallow depth of field that it requires very precise focusing, and the Z6 regularly misfocused. As a result, we were forced to overshoot to be confident that we would get at least one shot in focus. Focusing completely failed us in backlit scenarios, which are common in portraits. As a result, we had to switch to manual focus. When we use the Canon R5 and R6, they have the most amazing autofocus system you've ever seen. 
It will pick out a bird in crowded woods before my eye can see it and find its eye and focus on it. I hope we can see that level of technology from Nikon. Canon made a huge leap from their previous camera to their current generation, so expectations are pretty high for Nikon to do the same, but myself, I'm a little, I'm a little anxious they won't be able to hit that high bar. These new cameras will definitely have two card slots, and I think anybody could have predicted that because so many people, including us, completely hammered Nikon for only giving us a single XQD card slot. I predict they'll have one XQD card slot and one SD card slot. I think two SD card slots could be okay, especially in the Z6 with only 24 megapixels, but I don't think Nikon's going to back away from that XQD card. I also think that they'll both have higher frames per second. That's what NikonRumors.com is predicting. And that could mean a few different things. Nowadays, with these mirrorless cameras, they're giving us a frames per second number that's very theoretical. Like, that maximum number you see is usually only when using the electronic shutter and often without any kind of autofocus. We found that with the original Nikon Z6 and Z7 cameras. They advertised, I think, 12 frames per second on the Z6, but then when we actually shot moving subjects with it, we were getting more like three to four frames per second. Nikon Rumors is also saying that they'll have a bigger buffer, which allows you to take more pictures sequentially if you're shooting in continuous high, and this kind of goes along with the higher frames per second. If you can take more pictures in a second, then you therefore also need a bigger buffer. Both cameras are rumored to have 4K at 60 frames per second video. That's become increasingly important, and I, I know a lot of you think you don't necessarily need that, but I have been filming our out-of-the-studio videos at 4K at 60 frames per second. And even if I'm just publishing in HD, it's giving me a lot of versatility. More and more, I find myself punching in to do in-camera crops, allowing me to make it look like I have two cameras when I only have a single camera going. And the 60 frames per second allows me to slow down clips to half speed and still have them be good and smooth and look okay. And as a, like a guy who produces several videos a week, that's really useful not just for special effects but just for kind of dragging out bits of b-roll when you need to cover something so i look forward to having that the cameras are also rumored to have an improved user interface and i don't know precisely what that means but maybe they're talking about the ability to touch and change controls from the touch screen because that's really what needs to be improved they're also going to be having a vertical grip for it a lot of people don't use a vertical grip but you know we have a vertical grip on our D850 over here, and if you're shooting vertically, especially things like portraits or sports, that makes it just easier to hold, and a lot of people like the extra heft. Nikon Rumors also said that there was improved functionality with expected firmware updates after release, and I find this to be such a double-edged sword because, like, I'm always glad when they add features to a camera, but it's come to mean that the first cameras shipped are really like beta cameras, like. Canon really drastically changed some aspects of the R5 and the R6 when they released their firmware update that largely addressed the overheating problem. And especially as a reviewer, it means whatever I happen to get might not be the camera that you guys get. And that makes things really hard to review. And it also means that Nikon might be advertising features that either don't come for a long time or never tend to come. And we did see some of that with the Z6 and Z7, especially with the advanced video capabilities that everybody was just kind of waiting and waiting and waiting for. But there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Like, we don't know the price, though. I'm going to take a guess about that in a second. I'm also going to guess about the mechanical and electronic frames per second. And the frames per second with the autofocus is a big unknown. That can drop a lot. They will have 4K60, but is it going to be line skipped? Like a lower quality, mushier version of it? The EOS R5 has 4K60, but it's line skipped, and you can definitely see in side-by-side -side footage. We know they're improving the autofocus, and it will have animal and human IAF, but how accurate is that subject detection going to be? In my time reviewing the Nikon Z5 here, I'm still working on my review, I find the subject detection to actually be extremely unreliable. As an old SLR user, I can just switch to a single autofocus point and pick it out, but when you're comparing it against other cameras of these price points, it can be a bit frustrating. And I found even at the beach, I was trying to take a picture of a faraway lighthouse and the Z5 kept focusing on 
the sand like right near my feet at the bottom of the frame and it was damn near impossible to get it to focus on the obvious subject right dead center in the middle of the frame. It kind of does that over and over again. So I hope that's not a bad harbinger of what's to come in the Z6 and Z7 Mark II. I also wonder how the video autofocus is going to be on these cameras because we've seen the stills autofocus improve with firmware updates on the original Z6 and Z7, but time after time manufacturers have shown that they don't really get what creators need in the field of video autofocus. Uh, the focus needs to be smooth. It needs to be able to sort of psychically predict the right subject and snap that into focus without it looking jerky. And right now, Canon has that worked out and they've had it worked out for years. And that has pushed a lot of creators to the Canon platform, including the Canon that I'm filming this on now. Sony has only figured it out with the A7S Mark III, a $3,500 camera that we're also using, but every other Sony camera is insufficient. So right now, it's a very competitive field. And if that video autofocus works, then a lot of creators will want to build that into the workflow, but if it doesn't, then they're going to be steered to probably Canon. I also wonder if it will have 5.6 gigahertz Wi-Fi, because that's a feature that Sony has included in their latest cameras and Canon included in the Canon R5. And I think especially with some firmware updates, we might finally move past that SD card to computer workflow and be able to quickly and seamlessly transfer stills and video files to either your phone or your tablet or your laptop or your network attached storage without having to pull out that tiny floppy. So here's my guesses about the prices and the frames per second. I think the Z6 Mark II, I think they have to hit that $2,000 price point. Not only is that the price point of the Sony A7 Mark III, really the most important mirrorless camera ever and one of the most popular, but it's the price point of the Panasonic S5, which my opinion, better than the Sony A7 Mark III. It's a fantastic camera, and I'll want to be comparing the Z6 to that S5 because it's the best camera at that price point. I don't know the frames per second for the Z6 Mark II, but I'm going to guess that the mechanical shutter will give us 10 frames per second, and the electronic shutter will give us 15 frames per second. I'm hoping with the dual X-Speed processors that we'll be able to get 8 frames per second with the mechanical shutter and 12 frames per second when actually tracking moving subjects. The Z7 Mark II is 45 megapixels, and I think they'll repeat the opening price of the original Z7, which is $3,500. That's a price point that they've liked. That's what the D850 launched at. That puts it squarely against the Sony A7R Mark IV that I'll compare it against in just a second. I think they'll advertise 10 and 12 frames per second, 10 with the mechanical shutter and 12 with the electronic shutter. Note that's a little bit less than the Z6, but it's 45 megapixels. It's moving more data, and I'm not sure that they could get it much higher. Should you upgrade to the new Z6 Mark II from the original Z6? It, do that if you want 4K60 so you could introduce some slow motion or drag out those B-roll clips. Do it if you're struggling with the stills AF. If the AF isn't a problem, if you've worked all that out, then I don't see the need to upgrade. You aren't going to get better image quality out of it. That's going to be the same. Do it if you need a higher frames per second, especially when tracking moving subjects, or if you're anxious about having only a single card slot and you want that instantaneous backup. I know that was a deal breaker for me with the original Z6. What about the Canon R6 versus the new Z6 Mark II? The Canon R6 is $2,500, and I expect it to be more expensive than the Z6 Mark II, though I think within a few months, we'll see that price start to come down, maybe even for the holidays. The R6 is only a 20 megapixel camera, so the Z6 will have 20% more megapixels, and that does yield a visible difference in the amount of detail that you get. They both shoot at 4K 60 frames per second. We'll see if the Z6's video is line skipped, though, because the R6 4K 60 is absolutely gorgeous. The R6 has a forward flip screen, which especially for creators, is really, really important. Even if you only need it once in the entire lifetime of the camera, that's going to be a big deal. The Z6 will, I think, just have a tilt screen. The R6 advertises a full 20 frames per second, and even tracking moving subjects, we're able to get about 18 frames per second. I don't expect the Z6 to match that. They both have a viewfinder with about 3.7 million dots. How will the Z6 Mark II compare to the Sony a7 III? This is the most important camera, because Sony has just taken over full-frame mirrorless. They'll both have exactly 24 megapixels, but the Z6 will outdo it in video by having twice the frame rate. I also think the Z6 will beat it for the frames per second, and 
So buffering was always a problem on the Sony a7 III. I think the Z6 will definitely be better than that, and certainly it'll have a better user interface because it really <laughs> couldn't have a worse user interface, right? So I think the Z6 overall is going to be a winner against the Sony a7 Mark III, but we're still waiting on the Sony a7 Mark IV to come out, and actually I'm going to make a video about that. So subscribe to see it because I think I know what the a7 Mark III is actually going to be and can actually show it to you. The Z7 Mark II, let's compare it to the Canon R5. These are both 45 megapixel cameras. The R5 is at $3,900 and I think the Z7 is going to have to be cheaper than that. The R5 beats the Nikon for video, coming in with beautiful 8K video full width or 4K at 120 frames per second. These Z7 simply cannot match that. The R5 also has a forward flip screen, whereas the Z7, I think, will only have a tilt screen. So clearly, if you're a creator, a video guy, you're still going to be drawn to the Canon world. Canon also has that amazing AF, which I'm doubtful the Nikon is going to be able to match. And that can be really tough for Nikon as more and more people need to do hybrid video and stills with their cameras. The R5 currently does 20 frames per second. I don't know that the Nikon will be able to match that, but I don't know. Uh, and the R5 has a 5.8 million dot EVF, which is beautiful, and I, I don't think the Nikon's going to get that higher resolution. The Sony a7R4 is Sony's full-frame high megapixel camera with 60 megapixels. Compared to 45, honestly, we have not been able to see any difference, and not seeing any difference was enough for my wife Chelsea to keep shooting with the original Sony a7R3, because she just said, like, the extra megapixels are slowing down my workflow and I'm not seeing any visible improvement, so why bother? The Z7 will beat the Sony a7R4 for video at 60 frames per second. It's just 30 frames per second. They both have tilt screens. The a7R4 is only 10 frames per second, so I think that's easy to beat. For people absolutely nuts about resolution, you can try the pixel shift thing, though I have almost no luck with it. Even with a very heavy tripod, it's hard to get it to work right, and the A7R Mark IV has a little bit higher quality EVF, though again, it's like a nice to have. So questions for you. Will you buy this if it is the way I have described it? And if not, what else do you want out of it? Like what are you hoping to see from Nikon? And do you think they'll ever ship? Because this is a very real problem for Nikon. You know, it's been about two years since the launch of the Z mirrorless system, and of their holy trinity of lenses, a wide normal and telephoto f2.8 zoom, that's what all pros need, only one of those three lenses is currently shipping today. Like they announced the 70 to 200 in January, but you still cannot buy it. I really wonder what's happening with Nikon's distribution and why they can't actually ship these things to customers who want to buy them, make the stuff, we'll buy it. And will these cameras be enough to save Nikon. I don't know the answer to that, but I was, I was disappointed to find out that they were going to be in the same bodies, that they weren't having any sort of breakthrough video capabilities. I mean, look, I don't need 8K and I kind of do video for a living, but 8K got everybody talking. And looking at these specs, I'm not sure that there's going to be anything for people to talk about. And Nikon needs to make a real splash. They need to have something that we haven't seen before, something that can get the reviewers excited so that we'll get you guys excited for it. Thanks to our sponsor, Squarespace. If you need any kind of website, go to squarespace.com slash Tony and set it up to get a 14-day free trial. You do need a website, by the way. So many people nowadays are just relying on social media. Like I go to get some takeout and I have to go to Facebook and I, I see all this clutter and ads and messages and notifications that I don't want to see just because I'm trying to find a menu. Like, tell your favorite restaurant to go to squarespace.com slash Tony and set up a real website where they control all of the content and you don't have to deal with spam and advertisements. Social media simply is not enough. After your trial, use the coupon code Tony and you'll get 10% off. And don't forget to subscribe to see our upcoming reviews of the Z6 Mark II, the Z7 Mark II, and a bunch of other cameras because we're just like so backlogged. Oh yeah, the Nikon Z5, which I still haven't made a video about. Thanks guys. Bye.